The History Club has been lucky to schedule several guest speakers to talk about various issues related to history and social studies. Recently, we were able to speak to professor and author Michael D. Gambon. He received his doctorate degree from the University of Chicago and is a current professor at Kutztown University. In addition, he is a veteran that served in Iraq. He is the author of over nine books, with his latest being Modern Conspiracies in America, Separating Fact from Fiction. In the book, Professor Gambon provides case studies of popular conspiracy theories in America from the past 100 years, covering the Protocols and Elders of Zion, Russians and McCarthyism, the Kennedy assassination, 9-11, Sandy Hook, Chemtrails, the 2016 election, the 2020 pandemic, QAnon, and the Stop the Steal 2020 election. He has even made a college course that investigates the history of the conspiracies and helps to build a habitual toolkit or critical thinking skills that allow students to challenge these flawed narratives. While we did plan and do plan to organize these interviews and talks into sections to better engage our audience, we have kept this long form video raw. Press Professor Gambone approached the talk as more of a back and forth discussion. Multiple topics were discussed briefly and in detail, including JFK, QAnon, Pizzagate, and even election fraud. Thus, we couldn't exactly clip this chat into neat, specific sections since we were all over the place with our talk. We hope you enjoy the talk and check out Professor Gambone's work. And then hand it over. Okay. All righty. Thank you. Yeah, so my name is Mike Gambone, and I teach at Kutztown University. I've uh, been here since 1999. Um, I started my career doing Latin American history. Um, so my dissertation's on Nicaragua. And if uh, future me had come back and told me I'd be doing this right now, I wouldn't have believed them. Um, this, this is uh, like my third or fourth uh, career right now. So I got the idea for the book. Uh, it's probably somewhere in the... Uh, introduction. Um, I had lunch with one of my professors from Penn State. Uh, we still talk every year. And she had started doing this course. And I thought, wow, what a great idea. I'm going to steal it. So I did. Um, and I just kind of built it from there and started teaching it at Kutztown in 2016. I'm looking at my enrollments for spring and I have right now I have 157 kids enrolled in this class. So um, the kids love it. Um, and I think their basic reason is everybody has their own favorite conspiracies. I'm curious to see what you guys have, because I, I know there's and I know one of them is going to be the moon landing. So that's almost a given. Um, uh, I think that's, go ahead, please. Uh, I was going to say, if there's if you see that they're staring straight forward, you're on a big projector. So they're watching you, but not through the camera. But but yeah, if you guys want to, what are some of your favorite conspiracies? Flat Earth. Yeah, I heard Flat Earth. Flat Earth's a good one. What What else do you have? Porter likes the first Thanksgiving. Oh, really? <laughs> how, are you, how are you framing that as a conspiracy? I'm curious. <laughs> I, I, was, I was kidding. Like, just, uh, just uh, how history can be mythologized a little bit. Oh, okay, because I was going to say, you, have, you could have settlers conspiring against Native Americans. That's pretty much a given. Um, in some of these scenarios. Yeah, I, I honestly think some of this stuff like flat earth um, is just a great example of bad science being misapplied. Um, the chemtrail chapter I wrote is like that. Uh, it drives my uh, science majors crazy when we talk about it. Um, but I think like, you know, jokingly or not, Thanksgiving's interesting because I think you can dig into history and find some real serious conspiracies that exist. Um, one of the topics I added to class this spring was the uh, Japanese American internment. And if you look at how the War Department basically lied to the Justice Department about uh, some of the policies, uh, that ended up in front of the Supreme Court during the war. So you've got official conspiracies that are real that coexist with the crazy ones that we like to laugh at. And I think that's that's another interesting part of the you know the course in the book that I'd like to talk about a lot. So. Anybody else have any favorites? Personally, my favorites uh, are the JFK and MLK assassinations. Those are soft, those are good ones. I totally agree. JFK is my favorite. Um, I was talking, I was being interviewed a couple of weeks ago, and I said, it's amazing we spent my lifetime talking about basically about two minutes of history. You know, and I don't know if you've ever looked at the Warren Commission or the House Special Committee. Um, 
my God, what a great place to start research, you know, and talk about how different types of technologies have evolved so we can evaluate the magic bullet. Um, somewhere buried in the book is a reference to Gerald Posner, uh, who wrote about that really good book called Case Closed. Um, because what you're going to start doing is le like learning about metallurgy, you know, ballistics, forensics, um, nothing I'm an expert in, but it's all part of that story. So, you know, I love the Kennedy stuff and Martin Luther King by extension, same thing. You know, when, you, when you're talking about the authorities that investigate the incident and what their culpability might be, um, that's really interesting stuff. So, so far, so good, guys. Oh, we yeah. got another one. Uh, the Rothschild and Bohemian Grove. No, I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you on that one. He said the Rothschilds and Bohemian Grove. <laughs> You know, believe it or not, when I got married, I actually met some of the Rothschilds. Yeah. Um, really interesting people. Um, old money, you know, kind of class. I think you got to, I mean, take your pick of, you know, everything that's spun off from that to include, um, you know, the old standards like the Illuminati, um, the Masonic Lodge conspiracies. Um yeah, that kind of idea of the of old elites, you know, turning the screws of authority. Um, really good thing to read. I don't, I'm just going to keep doing this. Do you guys give up? I'll just keep recommending stuff to read because it's kind of what I do. Um, there's a really good piece that a guy named Richard Hofstadter wrote called The Paranoid Style of American Politics. Um, he wrote that piece in 1964, but he could have written it yesterday. And he, they actually talk about the, you know, groups like the Rothschilds in it. So really good read. Um, yeah. So that's a really good one. So, well, let me tell you a little bit about the intro. Um, one of the things I wanted to do was develop a way for people to try to dissect a conspiracy. So when I talk about, you know, like building this toolbox, um, it's just a way of saying, you know, we needed some kind of method to evaluate, assess, however you want to say it. I think when you guys get out of school and you go on to college and your jobs, that's one of these skills you really need. I mean, it's not just that something that history owns. It's something I think you learn from a good teacher who teaches you how to research. So I always start with the basics. I said, what's the claim, right? So you got to start out with what are you saying happened? You know, how are you stating it? And sometimes claims get complex, you know, like why did, why was Kennedy assassinated, right? Who's the protagonist or are there more than one? And for Kennedy, something like that, there's obviously people have thrown, you know, spaghetti at the wall. So let me ask you that. Who's your favorite conspiracy, you know, conspiracy culprit for Kennedy? Where would you want to start with that? Well, let me say that one. LBJ. 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 Okay. Good. Yeah. I mean, you talk about one of these characters, right? I mean, it's amazing what you read about this guy that's actually true. I mean, it's it's incredible. So he's the guy that did it. What's the reason? What's the motive? He went to the Vietnam War. He wanted to expand the war? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's where you kind of have been cahoots with the Defense Department and uh, the military industrial complex and off and on you go. So, yeah. So you've got, you know, a main culprit and maybe a conspiracy of more than one, which is actually what a conspiracy is. It's not just it's not just one person. It's a group or a group of institutions. All right. Fair enough. Right. So you want to start with that. You got a motive. You got reasons. You got people. Um, then you got to start talking about proof. Right. So whenever I write this on the board, I write claim, and then next to it, I write proof. So that's where you have to start linking things together, right? You got to move from why, you know, what you think happened to how you're going to prove it happened. And that's where these things run into trouble sometimes, because you got to provide some kind of direct link, right? You got to have something there. Right? What's also good to know is you have to know the context. So you got to know about LBJ. You have to know about the times. You got to know about the Vietnam War, right? You got to start studying, you know, like a, a story that starts small, but starts to grow, 
right? But all that matters because you need context. You really have to understand that to understand both the culprit and maybe the evidence. So how's that sound? So far, so good. I just got done teaching, so I'm still in that mode. And I don't have a I don't have a board to write on, so I'm doing the best I can. So when I when I talk about this stuff, you know, the basic elements, claim, proof, context. And then you get into analysis. I mean, how are you judging these things? And one of the one of the points I make to my kids all the time, and I say it's a pretty simple thing. You're treating that audience like a jury, right? And I just got done watching the Daryl Brooks trial, right? Because I was curious about that and evidence and presentation. And the key word is, or the key phrase is, you know, reasonable doubt. And I always say this because we get in these arguments all the time. We say, look, you don't know 100% positive that this happened. That's always true, though, because you're never going to have 100% certainty. You have to decide if all the things you're talking about reached a, the right threshold, right? That gives you maybe 51% or 60%. You're always going to have doubts, but you got to reach to that level. And I think it's the same when you talk about this stuff. At what point do you reach that's enough? And you're always going to be able to find ways to refine a topic. Um, you look at technology in 1964, looking at the magic bullet, it's going to be incredibly different. You fast forward 20 years, right? And then you fast forward again, 20 more years, right? But these are healthy discussions that are helping that percentage evolve because we start learning more, right? I do the Tonkin Gulf incidents in class and Sometimes you're going to have to wait 40, 50 years for something to get declassified. And then you're going to have a whole different, you know, array of evidence you can apply. So these stories always evolve. And when they evolve based on the evidence, that's the best. Okay. Does that make sense? Well, my future professors, yeah, we'll see. That's right. <laughs> hey, you never know. Um, a couple of my students have their PhDs now, so I've already been replaced. That's actually a nice place to be. So good stuff. Um, I'm trying to think about audience. You know, when I look at this, and I guess when I talk about this throughout the book, I kind of took a different attack on what the counterculture is. Have you guys ever talked about that in class, the counterculture? You ever talk about hippies? Do you guys know who the Beatles are? <laughs> yes. yes. All right. So you've probably seen the cover of Sgt. Pepper's. So, some heads. Yes, yeah, some heads. What? <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is ancient times of 1967. So a lot of people are going to say, you know, the, the first time we start challenging authority is when the boomers were in college and they're hitting, they're basically your age almost. They're slightly older. So the, the late 60s. And I think one of the things that I discovered in the book was that I really think that happened a lot earlier. Um, I think that started happening after World War II. I think it started happening when Joe McCarthy was running amok, uh, denouncing every authority figure he could find. Uh, it's amazing when you think about the early 50s, you know, we always think of it as the kind of Ozzy and Harriet suburban utopia. But McCarthy's going after the president, the secretary of state, the defense department, the army. Um, what he's doing is actively undercutting people's faith in, in the institutions that were kind of the bedrock of the country. I think that's a starting point. I think by the time you get to Kennedy, people already have doubts. People are already worried about conspiracies. And I think we just took it from there. Uh, you talk about the Vietnam War, you talk about Watergate. You get into all the things that happened in the wake of that, the church committee. You start looking at, you know, CIA domestic operations. Um, some of you guys are probably know what MK Ultra is, right? <laughs> yeah. Those are real things, right? And I guess what I'm saying is when you look at the, the context of the audience, your grandparents were skeptics. You know, your parents were skeptics because of that. You're skeptics because of them. It accumulates. It's like layers of sediment. So you look at today when somebody throws a conspiracy out there on Twitter. Oh, are you still there? 
Jake, it's not that, it's not that hard to understand why people are so interested in this stuff. We, we lost we lost you for about eight seconds. It froze. Well, luckily that was the worst eight seconds I ever used in class. So. <laughs> no, I, I think just just to loop back, I think um, conspiracies have accumulated over time to the point where the audience is ready for them, right? I mean, one of my favorite shows when I started teaching was The X-Files. I love that show. So it's on Fox and it becomes part of culture. It's part of, you know, popular discussions. And I'm watching 1899 on Netflix right now. You know, the A.J. Abrams mystery box show. I mean, we love this stuff. I mean, it's very attractive because we love mysteries. We like to try to figure things out. Um, we like to connect dots. It might be about history. It might be about literature or art. But I think there's a lot of reasons why audiences come to this. So that's kind of a long-winded intro, but any questions about that or comments? Doesn't look like any. All right. Well, I hope I'm doing okay. Yeah, you're doing great. <laughs> well, let's talk about Kennedy. Because I have a chapter on that, right? Let's focus in on that. That'll be the that'll be kind of the the mainstay of this thing. So when you look at the claims about Kennedy, you know, that somebody killed them, and I think the argument, you know, people have been talking about, you know, they're trying to expand the Vietnam War. That's a pretty good one that that, that I've seen a lot of. If you look at Kennedy's time, you know, he's a cold warrior, right? He's one of the guys actively promoting the war itself. One of the things I point my students at all the time are this, it's a series of documents called the Pentagon Papers. Right. You guys ever covered that ever? Talked about it? Okay. You can probably find it in any public library. Um, the Defense Department did its own history of the war from 45 to 67. And it didn't release it until um, a guy named Daniel Ellsberg leaked it to the New York Times, right? So it was actually a secret history for a really long time. And one of the things it really demonstrated was how quickly Kennedy was escalating troop deployments from about 61 to 63. Um, they probably increased by a factor of 20. So I guess, the, you know, the point here is I'm already kind of testing the claim about, you know, why they killed him because he was, you know, they wanted to expand the war. And I think the premise is a little bit flawed because if you look at Kennedy himself, he was already doing it. You know, we already we were already expanding the war pretty rapidly in 60 by 63, no question. And Johnson just basically took it from there. So it's an interesting story when you think about his relationship with the military. In a lot of respects, he was giving them what they were asking for um, even before he died. So. I always point that out because that's kind of part of context, but I'm already kind of testing the evidence, which is what you do here. You're always making the pieces and the formula work together. So does that make sense? And I'll tell you what, if any of you guys are interested afterwards, if I, you know, I, what I do for a living is create lists of books. If you're interested in that topic or any of the ones, or if you want the syllabus for the class, I'm glad to share it. So if that's if that helps. It would help. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's talk about, well, let me ask this, since we're talking about Kennedy, which part of the, say, the the, the event, you know, I, I focus on the magic bullet, but is there a specific part of that you like to look at? There's the lady that had the big camera, and they never found out who she was. Yeah, I'm a little trouble hearing you because it's coming through garbled. You said a lady with a camera that they couldn't find that was in the footage, but I guess not in the footage now. Hmm. Or is, are you talking about the umbrella man? No, it's like some lady that had her camera out and like they wanted to find her for her footage and they never could find her. Yeah, I think somewhere in the Posner book, he lists the total number of still pictures and videos taken. There was hundreds of pictures taken. So it's in that kind of compendium of evidence. And the Warren Commission ended up with most of it. Um, the problem is they didn't get all of it because these are tourists with Instamatic cameras and God help us, um, eight millimeter you know, movie cameras. So 
are we basically saying they you know they 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 couldn't find her because they they basically didn't want to or who what are we talking about here? I'm not clear. She was pretty close to like right when it happened, like the right right place, right time, and they just couldn't track her down. Hmm. Yeah, I'm curious to see who the heck that is. Is she actually in the Zapruder film by any chance? I, they have pictures of her. They just couldn't find out who she was. Huh. Yeah, now I want to know that. So hopefully one of you guys, if you have the name, I'd be curious to follow up because I, I just, I, I don't know. Um, you have to update the book. What's that? Nothing. I said you have to update the book. Yeah, maybe. Um, God knows after the January 6th committee, I'm going to definitely have to. Um, I can't wait till they publish their stuff. Well, I know you guys, they were some interest in the elections. Did you guys want to do 16 or 20? The 2016 or 2020? I was, I was going to say that might also be, uh, uh, I guess, relevant to them because they kind of like lived through it. Like when you talk about JFK Vietnam, you know, these these are things hitting close to home for you. Uh, this is these are things like they would literally see here. Uh, we're in a heavy red area, so they hear all sorts of things. Um, so sure. that, that might be an interesting segue. No, absolutely. Um... Because I can, I basically kind of mash up the 2016, 2020, and QAnon chapters because they're all interrelated, no question. And uh, you get the extra special bonus that uh, I'm a, I'm an election judge in a precinct in Pennsylvania, so I got to see that election firsthand. Oh yeah, and um, I had people with ballots in hand wanting to show me YouTube channels so I could watch them before they voted to prove that it was all fake. Um, yeah, we're a weird country, I'll tell you that much. Um, but yeah, we managed, we muddled through. Um, yeah, let, let's talk about QAnon a little, I guess, because that definitely is alive and well in both elections and right now. Um, I think one of the features that I discovered in doing all this was that people love to create scapegoats. And people like to attribute, you know, actions to these kind of mysterious, powerful, and very kind of morally degenerate elites. That's that's a really common theme in all this. So when you talk about the Rothschilds, they're definitely going to be lumped into this. Uh, the Illuminati, the Mas Masonic lodges, the Rotarians. I mean, literally anybody who volunteers to do anything could be part of this. And I think it gets a lot of traction because it gives people what amount to a crusade. I think it's one way for people to give themselves agency uh, and basically the sense that they're morally better than the problem they're trying to solve. I see that a lot. Um, QAnon is just weird, though, because it's very recent. I mean, it's built on a lot of the roots of stuff I've just talked about that you could go back to, like, you know, the protocols of the elders of Zion and anti-Semitic campaigns, but it, of all places, and you probably know this, it appeared on a, you know, a message board. I mean, it's, it was on 4chan about, by this point, about four or five years ago. And it it's portraying, you know, elites at war with each other, basically. You know, that among the elites, there's a civil war going on. You've got the evil pedophiles trying to take over the world, and you have the good elites fighting them. And you, you guys, obviously, I mean, I'll ask you this. Do you know who generally, you know, people assign the Q to who they think Q is? And this, this goes back to like eight, 2018, 2019, that ballpark. You know, you know, generally who they think Q is? It's, well, it's Donald Trump. I mean, they really think it's him. Um, one of the things I love about the internet uh, it's because you could take something down from YouTube, but it never goes away. You know that, right? Yeah. Yeah. yeah you go. You you get onto the old uh, time machine, and you can find anything. So one of the videos I found for the book was uh, a 2017 version of Marjorie Taylor Greene explaining QAnon, right? And I have it. I have the link. It's in the book too. I've watched it a bunch of times, and that's what she thought. That's what she was portraying about four years ago. And say, well, it's him. I mean, he's the guy fighting the good fight. Uh, once we win, we'll have mass arrests and all the bad people will go to Guantanamo. Um, you've got his former national security advisor, Michael Flynn. I mean, a three-star general uh, who made the QAnon pledge during the 2020 election. Um, 
I talked to a guy who teaches officers and I, and I asked him, how did this guy get a security clearance? I mean, he, but he did, you know, he was in the inner circle of the white house national security structure for a while. I guess the question I always ask myself is why is this so popular during an election, right? Why, why is it such a useful thing? Um, I think it helps motivate people. I think by pointing out good and evil, it gives them a cause. Um, it puts them on the right side. Um, I think it's a good vehicle to give you know a sense of power. And I think it's, that's a very important thing for a, anybody who really considers themselves to lack that power. Um, I'll give you an example of that. You guys heard of the QAnon shaman? <laughs> Have you heard of that guy? It's, it's hilarious. <laughs> What's that? He's hilarious. I love him. Yeah, I actually, you know, I did a, I, I did a deep dive on him. I'm thinking, why in God's name is this guy wearing a horned helmet? And you know, you saw him. You know what he looks like. Um, <laughs> yeah, with the face paint, right? Yeah, yelling and screaming. I mean, if you actually listen to the audio of him on January 6th, I mean, he's yelling war chants and doing all that stuff. Um, but if you actually look at what he does, he's he's one of the, he's basically a new age spiritualist who's promising a way for people to empower themselves in the world. And again, you're giving somebody a, a way to give themselves agency, right? They can fight evil, they can make themselves important again. Um, and I found that it was really interesting. If you have people who live in Rust Belt communities who have been disenfranchised by you know global markets who can't rely on employment security anymore. Um, if you live in the Rust Belt like I did, I grew up in Eastern Pennsylvania. I grew up in a steel town, right? They want a way to fight back and give themselves some self-value. This is a hugely appealing thing, hugely appealing, right? So you got this kind of combination of all these things that appeal to this kind of new age men's movement, which is what the QAnon shaman is focused on. Uh, it's the same thing when you look at why uh, yoga groups made up of suburban women join QAnon. It's exactly the same, you know, self affirmation and self help. Uh, this becomes one of the ways to do it. And a lot of the, you know, really interesting journalism on this is how quickly some of these, you know, Instagram groups become conspiracy hotbeds. You know, you start out with, you know, downward dog and you end up with QAnon. It's really weird. But what I think it's doing is tapping into that same need. Um, and I think what politicians have done is found out that this is what, you know, this is what gets the blood flowing. This is what gets people to rallies. Um, it's very convenient as a political tool. Um, and I think that's how it's got, it, it got into all this. If you look at the Pennsylvania governor's race, I'm sure you guys did. Um, it was it was alive and well right there. Um, same thing with the, you know, parts of the, the other congressional races I saw in this state. And I, I don't think it's going away anytime soon because it's just so useful for a certain part of a base, you know, to, to cite that, uh, cause you could fight against. Um, I think where it gets dangerous is the fact that a lot, you know, 99% of this stuff is not rooted in reality. Um, I don't know if you, you've, have you guys ever followed the, uh, Comet Ping Pong Pizza event in Washington? You know what I'm talking about? You're talking about pizza game. Yeah, is that related to pizza game? Yeah, when the guy brought an assault rifle to a pizza parlor to look for, you know, enslaved children in the basement. <laughs> and he shows up at the, you know, these poor guys have been the subject of protests and attacks and they don't even have a basement, right? But some some genius decided that it was going to be, you know, their pizza menu is actually a menu for children. And just kind of you know, use that kind of false, you know, correlation approach that, you know, was really a, it, it kind of devolved into a really serious uh, police problem. And that was kind of your warning sign for January 6th, because people want to act on their convictions, right? And that's what we got. Uh, the guy got arrested, but the idea didn't die. I mean, there's actually been a lot of incidents like that in the country. Uh, that's the one we know, but that's not the only one. So, I think that's where you find this stuff in politics because it has a value. I guess I'll leave it at that. And um, you know what happens when people in authority embrace these ideas, they amplify them, right? You know that from being students in class, you kind of take your cues from your faculty 
if they say it, it must be right. I mean, they have a lot of responsibilities, but they, I think they treat him well. But if you just, you know, blather on Twitter and you're a senator, people will listen to that too. You know, and that that that's the problem. You know, when they make a claim, they have to have the evidence and they don't always worry about that second part. I think that's where we have, you know, the, the politics of today are defined by that gap sometimes. All right, I'm definitely talking way too much. Please dive right in. Um, so Pizzagate is a bit wacky to me. Um, yes. Crazy, because it, it's it's a very strange situation. Because this gentleman, this uh, good man, uh, who is fighting for those trapped pizza children, um, if he truly believes what he is doing is correct, he would be a monster not to do any. Right. But at the same time, pizza uh, p children trapped in the basement of a pizza place but he genuinely believes it so i don't know what to think i don't know what to think of him is he a hero for trying to uh take those children away from their uh pasta sauce making dungeon or or well <laughs> it's a philosophy experiment it is it's a it's a it's a it's a rorschach test it's a it's a it's a pizza grease Rorschach test. <laughs> nice. I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that metaphor, just so you know. Um you better credit me. I want I want royalties on that now. Never gonna never gonna happen. All right. <laughs> luckily 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 we're not recording this, so there's no evidence. Uh <laughs> yeah. I know, I'm I'm kidding. Um I'll give you an example like this. I had dinner with a friend of mine who teaches accounting. So this guy deals in numbers constantly. That's all he does. And he kept telling me that, you know, Republicans should steal elections as much as Democrats and make it even. And I said, what is that based on? What possible evidence do you have? And he finally admitted he didn't have any, but he really believed it. Therefore, it was real. And I, I think that's where you can take a moral action, but it has to be based on something based on substance, Right. It's not just, you know, this guy's guilty of suspicion. Um, that's usually not how it works. Um, I just can't randomly tell students they're cheaters if I have no evidence of it. Um, well, you look like a cheater. Well, that that's not going to fly, right? I mean, that's basic, you know, common sense. But so, yeah, I think the moral litmus test, you know, that Rorschach test, which is an awesome metaphor, I got to tell you, Um it's got to have a substantive foundation. I mean, that's, I keep coming back to it. It's got to have, it's got to be real. Um, the chapter I wrote on 9-11, when we talk about the buildup for the war, uh, if we're going to send a nation into a conflict in 2003 and lives are at stake, you damn well better have proof, right? Because a lot of things changed after 9-11, uh, including my life. I deployed in 2006. I went over there. So whether it's personal or policy, you know, that's, that's a pretty good rule of thumb in my book. So hope that makes sense. What other questions do you folks have? I think the 2020 election is really interesting. Like, uh, there, there's like more broad, less evidence-based claims, but one pretty easy one to prove, I think, is the uh, Hunter Biden laptop story and how that was hidden on every kind of centrist or left-wing news network that was just hidden until after the election to get Biden president. Like, I, could, could you guys, could you repeat that? Because it's coming through garbled again. I'm sorry. He, he was saying that how uh, the Hunter Biden laptop story was uh, censored through like media and social media. Um, it was the FBI, correct? Like kind of talking to executives to say, hey, there's no evidence that so I'll put this out there. Well, even if that, like, Part didn't happen. It's just true that they did hold on to it yeah. for a long time to put the election after. So he was saying it's sort of like that. That's rigging it for uh, Biden uh, because they didn't have that information out there. Yeah, I mean that's. You go back to any any instance where you've got official power or official information interacting with media, right? It's it's like the dance of who gets what first. Right. And how a leak might go and how you can control the narrative as narrative as best you can. Um, the FBI is interesting at that moment because you've got, you know. 
reluctance to give the media anything. Um, it's the opposite of what Comey did in 2016 when he, if you ever read the letter he released right before the election, it doesn't say anything except that they're still, you know, investigating Hillary Clinton. So, yeah, I mean, there's a huge impact that an institution like that can have. Um, is if you're going to get into reasons why, that's going to take time. Uh, why they did that with the Biden, or the Hunter Biden laptop, I honestly don't know. Um, I think we're going to, that's going to be a major story driving a lot of the po political narrative next year. There's absolutely no question about that. Um, I also think, though, if you look at the special prosecutor that started up under Trump, um, that guy's been active now for almost two years and he's produced two acquittals. So it's not like they haven't had scrutiny of this. Um, one of the things I like to look at always is what the courts are able to see in terms of evidence, because that's the, that's the kind of the, the best litmus test for evidence. Um, that's why, you know, we didn't talk about Rudy Giuliani and the Four Seasons Landscaping Company, but mother of God, um, when you lose in court 60 times over claims like that, that's, that's not a good trend. Um, we'll see about the Biden laptop, though. That's for next year, for sure. Go ahead, Lou. All right, I cut port of that. You're talking about election fraud in Georgia? Like they found the votes in Georgia in a truck, I believe. Like how would the truck have even gotten there? Like why would the votes be in the first place? So one of the things I've watched over the summer was uh, the, the Dinesh D'Souza movie, uh, 6,000 Mules. And I learned a lot about Georgia and um, absentee ballots and drop boxes and things like that. Um, yeah, I guess the best way I can answer that is, you know, the, I would look at the specific claim about those types of ballots, and I would love to get into exactly what the claims were, date, time, place, and then just start kind of, re, you know, deconstructing that to figure out what, their, what the claim was. So what exactly are they saying happened? Did you had like a ballot dump in Georgia? I'm not really sure, but they did find a truck or something in Georgia, and they brought it up. See, that's where you want to get into the, you know, we start up with this discussion, like who they are, what, you know, exactly where the information's from, you know, things like that. Because um, these claims, you know, they fly back and forth. I mean, if they're happening right now in Arizona and actually Pennsylvania, we got a county that's refusing to certify. Uh, I'm not sure why, but you always want to get into the details. That's, that's really important. So I don't have a hard answer for that one, but I, I would absolutely definitely need to know more. Um, we have about less than a minute for the recording, but if you're okay, we could just keep going for any student questions. It just wouldn't record. Absolutely. Go ahead, Sophie. Do you think that Epstein killed himself? Good question. Do I, I, I didn't hear it. I'm sorry. Do you believe that Epstein killed himself? Oh. <laughs> uh so what I what I have to say is I have to know I have to go with the evidence. That's what I have to go with. I I can't I can't go with suspicions. Um, that's a great one though because obviously the high stakes involved, right? Um, yeah, I don't know. 